Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to take your seats, please? We have a great deal to discuss and a limited amount of time to discuss it in. So if you can uh, resume your networking in the coffee break, um, which is just under one hour and a half from now, that would be great. This is a really important uh, panel session, and I'm very keen to get it um, underway as soon as possible. Um, as you will see from looking at the panel, um, Hans-Jörg Maaßen is not with us. He um, received an um, important uh, message last night and had to fly back to Germany at 6 o'clock this morning. And we're very sorry to um, miss him. But I'm very glad that in his place we've managed to get Ivana Smolenova, who is an expert on information warfare at the Prague Security Studies Institute, um, author of a really... Um, I think, groundbreaking report on Russian disinformation in um, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, and now resident in Kiev, where she is in the front line of the um, information war um, there in Ukraine. And I think we all have a huge amount to learn from um, the Ukrainians and from the, uh, from, from, from the front line states, and I'll be looking forward to getting her perspective in the panel. Um, but we're going to kick off with... Um, uh, no long uh, remarks from me, certainly not any discussion of the British political system. We had quite enough of that. Uh, we had quite enough of that last night. Um, so we're going to, um, I'm going to go first of all to um, Gerhard Conrad, who is the director of the EU Intelligence and Situation Centre. Um, several people have asked me what the EU Intelligence and Situation Centre is, to which I would recommend the advanced investigative to, um, <laughs> tool of Google, which will tell you. But um, Gerhard Conrad is a distinguished um, German government uh, official before he uh, went to, this, to the Situation Centre. Um, after Ivana, I'm going to go to Taimar Peterkop, who is the Director General of the Information System Authority of Estonia, which is the uh, Estonian government body which runs the uh, e-government and CERT and other, the, all, the, the, all, all, the, all the hardware and... Um, systems and processes that make Estonia into the model of e-government um, that it is. And then finally we're going to go to my old friend Keir Giles, who is an associate fellow at Chatham House and knows more about Russia and Russian information warfare than anybody I've ever met. I hope that's a sufficient introduction, Keir. Uh, so, um, first of all, over to you, um, Gerhard Conrad. I'm going to ask for fairly brief opening remarks. You've all seen the... Uh, blurb about what this panel's about, fake news, the use of information attacks, uh, politicization of information, some of it new, some of it old. Tell us, how did this get onto the EU ad agenda and what does your centre do to deal with it? Yeah. Over to you, Gerhard. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your attention, for your interest. Uh, thank you very much for having and me here. Can we have that door shut, please? Um, I may just uh, introduce uh, my, my small shop inside the European Union uh, and then, then of course uh, come very, very quickly to what we are doing in terms of uh, looking at uh, information operations in within which framework we are doing so. So uh, as you certainly are aware of, uh, the European Union uh, since 2010, 2011 has an uh, European External Action Service, which is a surrogate for a kind of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, let's say, wherever, let's say, the EU is engaging, the member states of the EU are engaging in uh, common foreign security policy or in common security and defense policy, uh, there uh, the EAS, as it's called, the European uh, External Action Service, is at stake, is in place, is trying to uh, formulate uh, policy options submitted to the council uh, structures and then the council, uh, the Foreign Affairs Council, for example, the Foreign Affairs uh, Defense Council is taking decisions on joint action, whatever it means. Uh, within that uh, framework, uh, in the EAS, there is a directorate called Intelligence Assessment and Situation Center. Everybody is calling it uh, INSEN or Intelligence and Security Center, but it is, uh, I lay emphasis on uh, the fact that we are originally an intelligence assessment center. Why do I do so? Uh, the EU has no remit at all, uh, based on the treaties, uh, in intelligence collection uh, and intelligence processing as such. So we are not an intelligence service. Uh, we are an assessment center, a directorate, which assesses incoming 
finished intelligence from the EU member states' intelligence services. That's the basic, the basic uh, let's say, formula uh, based on which we work. Uh, what is the purpose of INSEN is, of course, creating uh, situational awareness and strategic foresight based on the, let's say, contributions uh, of the EU member state services for the decision makers in the EU. That is, first of all, the hierarchy uh, inside the ES. Second, of course, the decision makers in the Commission and, of course, in the Council. So again, the Foreign Affairs Council, mainly then represented by the so-called Political and Security uh, Committee, the PSC, uh, with its ambassadors of all the 28, uh, uh, receiving uh, our reports, receive our briefings on situational aspects with relevance of foreign and security policy, and with relevance to security, because uh, the INSEN is as well working on the topic of terrorism which is, of course, then more, let's say, and CT, counterterrorism, uh, that means which is a domain, of course, for the internal security services and, of course, law enforcement, but law enforcement is not our cup of tea, uh, as I said. So, quite shortly, inside uh, this INSEN, since 2016, there is a so-called hybrid fusion cell. And this hybrid threat fusion cell, but we call it hybrid fusion cell, is working on what everybody of you know much better than sometimes I myself, let's say, what are the hybrid threats emanating from hybrid state or non-state actors uh, who are doing hybrid policies. And within that framework, of course, let's say, information operations and cyber-based information operations play an increasingly important role. But I have to say, we are looking at the whole specter coming from, let's say, the so-called more simple traditional propaganda up to the acts close or short of war. Yeah? That's, the, the, let's say, the roughly the specter of uh, high, uh, hybrid threats we are, we are looking into. And one uh, element of it, or an important one, is the, uh, are the information operations put forward, not necessarily only by Russia. Of course, this might uh, today be the main, the main topic. And Russia, due to its size and, its, uh, let's say, of course, its uh, power, uh, is of course one of the very main actors in all that uh, in that regard. But we are looking as well not only on, let's say, this kind of threat or this kind of, uh, you know, let's say, risk we are facing, but of course we are looking as well into hybrid actions, information uh, operations in other parts of the world, uh, affecting as well European interests, and when I say European interests, it's a, uh, the interests of the European Union as such, and of course the interests of its member states. Maybe that as a first short uh, let's explanation why I'm sitting here sure. and what I'm doing. Thank you. Right, well thank you very much indeed uh, for that. And I, <clears throat> I think for those of us who've been following the um, evolution of the EU over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, um, it's really astonishing to think this is happening. If we'd said 10, 15 years ago that your organization would exist with the remit that it has and the activities it has, people would say, what are you smoking? And we should, I, think, I just want to un underline that. Um, and I think you've also, this, this point about the, the hybrid um, threat is, is very important. Which, whichever um, bit you pick out from this problem, it always leads on to the other ones. The information attacks wouldn't work without the digital weaknesses, the digital weaknesses and um, uh, a part of, and cyber attacks are part also of an attack on our confidence in the system. Um, and so all these things link into each other um, very quickly, which is both an advantage for an adversary and a difficulty for us. But I want to now focus a little bit on the information side and turn to um, Iv Ivana. Um, I think you and I both agree that we've got a lot better at spotting what the Russians um, and let's assume for the sake of argument we're talking about Russians. Obviously, all these vulnerabilities could be used by others, but Russia is a um, convenient hook for hanging all this on. We're getting better at what, seeing what the Russians are doing to us. We're not so good at working out why it works. But perhaps the Ukrainians, where you live now, are rather better than that, at that than we are. Um, give, give, us, give us your perspective from your, um, from your new home in Kiev. You're absolutely right. The first time I came to LMC was two years ago, uh, and I, I remember the, the discussion then, it was kind of about disinformation or like propaganda. Like many people were asking whether this is really a problem, you know, and I can see today there are two panels just on this topic, and then it's also covered in, on, in other panels indirectly. So I think we are advancing quite 
fast forward uh, in this topic while the other side is becoming more and more predictable for us because we start to understand it and start to understand what needs to be done. And there are a lot of good organizations within the EU, NATO, centers, a lot of good studies, uh, initiatives. So I, th um, I just want to start on, on a positive note, but uh, having said that, there are still a lot of challenges we're facing and we need to start focusing a little bit more. And as you, as you mentioned, uh, we tend to focus too much, well, this is a little contradictory to what I'm actually, what is my job, but we tend to focus too much on what, what Russia is doing, less on what, what weaknesses or problems it's exploiting on the ground. Because essentially they are just using what they, what they have at hand, you know? And we will never be able to stop all the disinformation outlets. It's impossible. Like, I mean, in, 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 in today's world, it's impossible to shut down all the websites, RT, et cetera. But we can still work on ourselves. And uh, I give you the example. So before I moved to Kiev, I lived in Kharkov, which is in the east of Ukraine. And, and I travel a lot around the Donbass. And you can clearly see uh, that the information is a huge weapon in the conflict. It's very important. But what makes it successful is the socio-economic situation in the region, it's the history, it's the years of, of uh, lack of development, it's the corruption, it's the, it's the oligarchs, and that makes it an effective weapon. And it's not, I, and I know Ukraine is a very extreme example, but then go to Slovakia, I'm actually Slovak, uh, uh, and, when you, and we have a big problem with this information website, or like the, and now we have extremists in the, in the parliament. I mean, the Kotleba party. And it's very easy for them to operate in Slovakia if the, if the current government in Slovakia is going from one crisis to another. It's one corruption scandal or another. And then you can compare it with the states uh, where the disinformation is, for example, less effective. So this is one of the, for me, the biggest challenges, like in analyzing why in some states it's more effective than in others. And I was recently writing an article on like different strategies of disinformation in different countries around Europe. So I was contacting experts or like government officials from various countries. And I, get, I got really interesting reply from Finland, for example. I was talking to a government representative uh, of Finland. And I asked him like, well, how do you think your country is different than other countries? And she was like, well, I actually think uh, we are much better, we are, our society is more resilient to Russian influence and Russian disinformation. And it's mainly because the government is talking more about it. I mean, it's not fully resilient, but it's, it's better than, than, for example, the Central Europe. Uh, our government is talking about it a lot. Uh, media, there are a lot of initiatives, etc. But when you look at the Finland itself, it's a, it's a case in point. It's got the second lowest corruption in the world. It's got the, uh, one of the most effective local governments in the world. It's got uh, one of the best education systems. In such environment, it's really hard to operate for, for any, for an entity. It doesn't need to be, and this is crucial to address those weaknesses and problems, because today it might be Russia, but tomorrow it might be somebody else. It might be right. China, it could be populist, it could be extremist, ISIS, etc. Et it's about those weaknesses we need to address. So. Super. Well, I think that, that's a, a, a very, also, um, if President Ninisto was here, he'd be very happy that you've laid the ground for his um, Lennart Mer Mary lecture this evening. But that point about social, societal um, resilience and how that kind of strengthens the immune system so that these, uh, we have antibodies um, so that the, um, these attacks don't work, I think is, is absolutely crucial. And I now want to turn a bit more to the digital side, because we're covering the, the, both the information and the digital um, here. And I'm a huge fan of the Estonian e-government system, and I'm really um, delighted that we're going to hear Tamar talk about it. And there, there are two things which I think are really vital here, which Estonia does and almost no other country does. One is to have a really solid system of digital <coughs> identity. So that as an Estonian, you can prove who you are, and you can check who the other person is when you're dealing with them online. You have a very high degree of confidence that your electronic interactions um, are with the people you think, and that the, when, you, when you sign something online, that that authentication really is um, going to work and that it can't be copied by someone else. I'm always amused when in Britain, I have an Estonian e-residency 
card, and I always want to use it. And I say to people in Britain, do you accept digital signatures? And they say, yes, that's fine. Just print it out, sign it, scan it, <laughs> and email it back to us. But, but put a copy in the post as well. That's not a digital sign. In Estonia, you have real digital signatures. So that's one huge bit. And the other is the X-road, or sometimes called crossroad. And this idea of having all the um, important information online, but not in one big digital Fort Knox, which is a target for, um, for, for attackers. Um, but... Um, spread out in, a, in, 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 in different databases, but all talking to each other. So um, I'm a huge fan, Tamar. Um, explain how this system fits into um, Estonia's national resilience, and how, 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 does this, how does this become not just a, something that's convenient, but something that's um, good for national security? Thank you. <clears throat> well, I was thinking about that we, a few days ago, we had a 10-year anniversary of 2007 cyber attacks, and to to make my case based on that, how what we did after that, uh, how we develop our our uh, uh, cyber defense system um, after that, uh, which is beside what uh, what you Edward already talked about, that uh, we have built in security in, in, into our digital uh, society, what we call a security by design, the X road, the digital identity, they all add uh, security uh, to to our digital society. Uh, so when I was uh, preparing my notes to talk about the, the, how we built this comprehensive defensive system uh, that is replicated by, by many other countries and, and by EU in the form of NIS directive, uh, then somebody decided to prove my point yesterday uh, with the wave of uh, crypto locker attacks uh, uh, that has been unfolding since yesterday. I, I, I read this morning from BBC that 99 countries have been uh, infected Estonia is not among of them. That's, that's a case in point that the, the, uh, the system that we built uh, has created resilience and uh, made, made us stronger. Of course, I'm, I'm sure that uh, after I made this statement. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, last year, the most important or mostly discussed cyber attack was, um, of course, the hacking of US elections. And I think that's a perfect case study of, of uh, the interaction between cyber and information warfare. The, um, the entire system that we built that is based on how to protect the critical information infrastructure, that is the infrastructure that the government is running on and all the vital services are running on. We built this system how to protect that infrastructure. And then it was the US elections was attacked, hacked. What was hacked? John Bodesta's Gmail account, DNC's uh, systems, that is a, a party, that is a non-governmental organization according to Estonian standards. So it's not a part of critical information infrastructure. So what that, we can draw several conclusions. One is that our dependency from ICT grows all the time uh, and we don't know all the, all the, the risks and, and uh, where we depend on it. And this is a case in point that we prepared for the con conflict we, ha we had in 2007, what was uh, branded some media, by some media as Web War I, um, but we didn't prepare for this. So with the development of technology, we will always have those new risk emerging that we are not ready to, to um, um, stand against. The, um, and I think very important uh, conclusion that we can draw from this US election attack is, is uh, it's, it all starts with us. It's, I'm sorry, I don't know John Podesta, but uh, his password in all the information system he used was runner 4567. With a weak cyber hygiene like that, we are all vulnerable. That our information is stolen and can be used in information warfare. So it all starts with us, with you and me here. And uh, coming from that to Estonian elections, I think it's, um, again, a perfect case study on, on information warfare or information campaigns and the digital systems. The, um, the claim is that US elections were hacked. So what can US Estonians do about it? It was John Bodesta's Gmail account that was hacked, not any government systems. Estonian e-voting system uses up-to-date cryptography is a, is, a, is, a, is a good system. It's our 
electronic voting is based on, on uh, electronic identity that Edward uh, mentioned, the, uh, the security issues are completely different than, than this uh, uh, hacking of a Gmail account. But still, you can create this uh, notion that elections are not safe anymore. Uh, most of the countries in Europe who have elections this year are, are talking about um, that the, um, uh, there is some sort of meddling from, from another nation state. Um, so how do you have a normal debate about that the technology, the architecture behind those two things are completely different? Uh, it's impossible almost to have this discussion between the technical people. The gap is too wide between the technical people and, and, and the political side. It's, um, uh, and what is happening in Estonia with uh, electronic voting is, is a very good example of that. Too bad it's happening only in Estonian, mostly in Estonian. And it doesn't help when, um, when a leader of a, of a close neighbor uh, calls your elections uh, uh, unsecure and, and she's basing her, her statement uh, uh, on a claim that we in Estonia consider to be fake news. Um, so it is a challenge to tell the difference where is a normal political debate and what is an information campaign. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Timo. And you brought out several really interesting points there. I, I think this idea of the gap um, we get this in business between the um, tech people in business and the, and the board who just can't speak each other's language, the gap between um, the technical people and political decision makers. I think the gap is smaller in Estonia than perhaps anywhere else I, I, I know. Um, but uh, it's, 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 it's a, good way, a good way of thinking about the problem. We've had um, now a perspective from the intelligence world, from the... Um, information world, from you in the cyber world. Keir knows all these three worlds very well. So I'm going to turn to him next to pull the, um, pull the threads uh, t together a bit and, and perhaps give us some idea of what our response should be. As we've heard, we're getting a bit better at working out what Russia is doing. We saw quite an interesting response in France, I thought, to the most recent attack. It's really tantalizing to think, how would the result in America have been different if the American media had reacted to the hack of the DNC and Podesta emails the way the French media reacted to the Macron, um, to the Macron, um, the Macron hack? Um, but please pull the threads together, and, 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 and if you can, give us a bit of a, uh, a signpost about where we might be heading. Certainly. Thanks, Edward. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The first thread I'd like to pull is to reiterate something you've heard already. This is not all about Russia. The tactics, techniques, and procedures we're considering are open and available to a range of different state and non-state actors acting hostile manner in information space with a range of different motivations. If you were in the Night Owl session last night, you might have gathered that some people in the room would probably like to think of the Brexit campaign as a hostile non-state actor operating in information space against European interests. But as Edward has said, Russia does make a convenient hook to explain all of this, particularly with the election season coming up and particularly because we have the two case studies already available of the US and French elections. And yes, the differences between the success of influence operations against them in one case and the failure in another is highly instructive. In my view, one of the root causes of the failure in the second case, in the French case, was because of what uh, people who have been studying the information influence problem, like me and my colleagues for some years, have been saying consistently since this information became fashionable again three or so years ago, that awareness is key, by which I mean public recognition of the problem and the threat, stating that there is a challenge, that there is hostile influence at work, and therefore empowering government and society and media to actually do something about it. So what you see is the, the possible primary and secondary objectives of meddling in the French election failing, not only influencing the outcome, but also discrediting the, discrediting the candidacy of Macron, fell flat because the French were prepared. 
I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room who was in Paris at the early part of this year having quiet conversations about the kind of influence operations that were already visible against Macron and where they might go from there based on the experience of the French election. It also helped, of course, that Macron's campaign office was staffed by IT literate 25-year-olds who were aware of cyber hygiene and recognized problems when they happened, unlike, let us say, Mr. Podesta. Put all of this together, and you have a key weapon in maintaining resilience against this kind of information operation, which is simply knowing that it is coming in the first place and being prepared and engaging all of those who might serve as facilitators for that operation, such as the media, in making sure that it does not achieve its desired effect. The result of that is that we have one manifestation of the problem in its current phase for which we have found countermeasures. But, I stress, in its current phase and that is only one aspect of the problem. Deterrence against the second and third layers of ambition for hostile information operations is much harder. And under that are classified, for example, let's say objectives short of state capture and regime change. I mean the pernicious long-term influence on policy or subversion of society if you can't reach any other target. Not the, the blatant lies and leaks, but the, the distraction saturation and the, the dripping of the toxic tweets which are ma amplified by the trolls and the bots combined with the chilling effect of harassment and intimidation on people who are studying it, observing it, reporting on it, commenting on it. Preventing that is far harder. Let's talk about how to deter it. It is true that cyber is possibly better suited than any other domain for retaliatory measures under the table against an adversary without the public generally being aware, avoiding the political fallout and burden of retaliating publicly and keeping arguments over proof in the private state-to-state -state or state-to-actor classified domain rather than having to prove your case in open court as the United States failed to do because they relied on producing documents that had stripped out all the classified content explaining why they knew that the Russians were behind the attacks, which made them effectively useless. You can keep this under the table that, of course, just like in conventional deterrence, you have to be aware of collateral damage. If you launch a Stuxnet, you have to be sure that its effect is going to be limited and it is not going to spread into the public domain and be have everybody aware of it. But Let's consider how many other Stuxnets may there have been that did actually reach their target, deliver their effect and their message, and then not surface in the public domain. However, with all of that, just like in conventional deterrence, deterrence by denial is far preferable to deterrence by punishment. It reduces the return on investment of the attacker, makes the effects harder to achieve, and therefore avoids having to respond to a situation when the damage has already done. And that's where the resilience building that we've already heard about comes in. But it takes time, and it takes effort, and it's expensive, and in some cases it may be too late. We may now be two and a half generations too late. We've gone past the stage where people would say, it must be true, I've read it on the internet. We've even gone past the stage where people say, it must be true, I've read it on Facebook, because as we know, by now, only old people use Facebook. <laughs> What's vital as a missing step in all of this is reliable measurement of the effect of hostile actions when they are below that threshold of being blatant and obvious. Tracing effect is difficult and expensive, but measuring it is absolutely essential. The amount that is being spent on countermeasures to hostile information influence at the moment is pitiful. But even that amount is wasted if we do not even know which effects need to be countered because we don't know which hostile actions work and which don't, because we do not trace through the effect of the information campaigns that we observe from public opinion space into decision-making space to see whether or not they work. And without that, it's a waste of effort. I'm not talking about setting up yet another disinformation newsletter. <laughs> I have lost track of the number that arrive in my inbox listing information campaigns and pointing out that they're not true, which is a complete waste of effort, I'm afraid, when plausibility is not one of their objectives. And I'm sorry to say, Edward, SIPA too. 
It also goes into the pile of those who are simply admiring the problem at the moment without actually proposing countermeasures or any way of specifically boosting resilience. You can point at fake news, but until you actually start to counter it, you're not getting anywhere. So, we see that one method of election and interference in political processes has already been successfully countered in one case in Europe, but we have plenty of other cases coming up. We need to think about what the next phase is going to be now that the adversary has detected that yes, we have put in place countermeasures for that specific approach. What kind of thing might we see in the next round? It seems to me that fake video is long overdue as an addition to fake text and fake news. The CGI technology for faking video is mature and affordable, and I'm surprised we have not seen it yet. So instead of rumors and gossip about politicians, why have we not yet seen videos of politicians taking drugs or taking bribes or, or taking liberties or torturing puppies or simply making policy statements which are completely incompatible with what they are supposed to say? It is simple and easy to arrange, and I would be surprised if we do not see it in some of the upcoming rounds of interference in elections. Thank you. In the UK, of course, we have an example where unlike over Brexit, Russia will have a clear preference for one particular candidate, so it would be strange for them not to interfere. Thanks very much. I was um, talking in the bar last night about a hypothetical scenario in which a hostile state actor would manage to hack into the president's Twitter account and send crazy tweets. The answer is, how, do, how, how would anyone tell? Um, I, um, thanks very much indeed, Keir, um, for that. I think you're absolutely right. We need to measure the reach and impact of disinformation before we start thinking about countermeasures. We know more about how people consume toothpaste than we do about how they consume Russian disinformation. We know um, how they make their choices, how much they consume, when they consume it. All this stuff is easily available. We just need to task some market research firms to do the quantitative and qualitative analysis that would give us an idea of um, who's being affected by this and why. And then we can start thinking about how to do it. But I completely agree with you. Until we, um, we, we, we do that, we are in danger of just attacking the bit of the problem that we see with the tools that we find um, enjoyable to use, and that will not get us anywhere. Um, there's a forest of hands going up already, but I'm going to first of all go to Sven, who um, should have really been on the panel but had another meeting. Sven is the director of the um, NATO Center, Cyber Center here in um, Tallinn. A microphone, I hope, is making its way towards you at some point. You can also shout, but I will just praise you a little bit, which is very embarrassing for Estonians until the microphone gets there. Um, the NATO Cyber Center is, is, is a, a real ornament of the um, Tallinn landscape. Um, you run it. Um, and I think what I'm particularly interested in hearing from you is how do we deal with the question of interstate cooperation? All, most, most of our institutions are national institutions, but this is a problem that almost by definition goes across um, international borders. So please give us your perspective on that, Sven. Oh, thank you, Edward, uh, uh, for putting me on the spot. I, um, uh, first, um, a very straightforward response is, no, we usually don't. Uh, people do not, or countries do not like to cooperate when it comes to cyber security, cyber defense, and that, I think, is not good. Uh, the CCDCOE uh, is one of the organizations where that is actually happening. And the problem with it that people uh, start a discussion usually from the wrong end. They start a discussion from, you know, we need to share more cyber security related information. Um, why, what we actually should be doing is that we should be putting people working together, cooperating together, because you share when you trust, you trust when you have worked together, uh, uh, and basically we should actually start from the other end. Um, if I can uh, say the, the other observation is that, and this is not the only conference, but on most of the conferences of this, side, uh, of this, um, uh, uh, of this kind, they cyber and information are always lumped together um, in one panel. And there might be some justification in that because for some reason, for some nations, I do not want to name names, really they, 
the cyber is a means to the information warfare end, and the end is to change the thinking and mind of our opponent. So there is some justification for that, but if you could someone show me a meme or a newspaper article, a fake news, what can actually blow up a power station, uh, I'd be very interested. Uh, so we are looking at kind of, you know, a different levels of, 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 um, of interaction between uh, nation states. And the, um, um, the, uh, uh, I would say the, the, the third observation, and I was late here, because I had another meeting, is that uh, lately we have um, seen and witnessed a lot of overblown rhetoric, so I put it this way, what I would caution against. What I mean by that is that a very good and well-intending politicians are saying things like, we are at cyber war, and we are at war. Uh, and I do understand why they say that, uh, to make a, make a case and make a point. But um, if you say that, you imply that there is a state of armed conflict between nations, mm -hmm. with all the legal consequences of that, first. Second is that if you say that too many times and you cry wolf too many times, when a wolf comes, the leeches will not come. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Sven, um, for that. And I do really commend the work of um, your centre here in Tallinn, and also the NATO Stratcom Centre um, in Riga. If you're not familiar with their websites and their publications, um, do take a look. And um, also your Lot Shields exercise is really, was really, really, really important and interesting. And there's a great video of that as well. Um, and thank you also for making the point that these weaknesses are not only used by hostile state actors. A, a, a cyber weakness is uh, useful for criminals, it's useful for hooligans, for terrorists, and all sorts of um, other people too. Right, enough for me. I have got so many hands up, we're going to need another hour. But I will start off. Um, I, guess I promised Rain um, to come to him first. So I'm going to microphone over here, please, as quick as possible. After that, Yarmor. And then Constantine. Raul Ramones, Stratcom, Estonia. My question is to Timer about e-elections. And uh, who is guilty? And, and uh, what is the reason that uh, there was never real discussion about to use it in other European countries? And uh, as we know, last year there were be, have been a severe attacks against the Estonian e-voting system and uh, uh, the credibility uh, is there any chance that we will be pushed back to horse and carriage? And what is the real reason that uh, other countries don't really discuss this uh, to, to adopt our system? Thanks very much. And now, microphone to Jarmo here, and um, then I'm going to Kostya, and then to James Scher. Thank you. Jarno Limnel, Professor of Cybersecurity, Finland. Thank you very much for bringing up this election security. I think we all agree that when we are talking about the elections, we are talking about the heart of the democracy. Uh, my question to you is that since there are coming so many important elections uh, in coming months in Europe, in UK, Germany, uh, Italy, uh, France, how worried you actually are personally? What is your personal assessment? How worried you are that some non-state or state actor may interfere these elections. And I would also like to hear your, more of your thoughts concerning about this, what Gare mentioned, the next phase of influencing. You were mentioning the fake videos. What else? Okay. Thank you. Very good. If you have the microphone on to uh, Kostya in the front row. Uh. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Konstantin Agat TV, Rain, Moscow. Um, I have a specific question to Ivana and to Kier. Um And with regard to cyber warfare and uh, this dumping of uh, stuff on, on, on the web, um, I, we have to remember that kind of seven years ago, it all started with WikiLeaks and then continued with Edward Snowden. And uh, I think our esteemed moderator was one of the first in the West to highlight the fact that these are not heroes. They're probably not heroes at all. So to what extent you think the Assange mania and the Snowden mania are now over? And to what extent uh, personalities like that 
uh, will have a, let's say, more just and more realistic assessment of their real activities than this kind of Guardian-esque uh, lionizing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I um, apologize to anyone from The Guardian who's here, but I love your use of the word Guardian-esque as a term of abuse. Uh, James, very briefly, and then back to the panel. Yes, thank you. Um, Russia is a hydra. And one of the problems is that even there, there are entities involved in this game who have different interests. Some of them want us to see the damage they are causing without necessarily identifying themselves. Some in the intelligence world do not want us to see that. Keir raised the issue with the FBI and what is discussed and what is not. My question is, in your assessment, to what extent do our, are our responses actually improving the capability of these actors to conduct these activities? Thanks. Thanks very much for that. That's a great question. Um, are we increasing the problem by admitting that we've noticed it? That's a really, uh, really interesting one. Well, I'm going to go to the panel from right to left. And um, Gerhard, I know um, you're constrained to some extent, but you are a German citizen. Um, you do have elections coming up, so we can ask you just as a German how worried you are and however much professional expertise you want to bring to bear on giving that answer will be, will be very interesting. Um, I'll go to Ivana next, and then uh, the uh, specific question about the um, Estonian system for Tamar. But Gerhard, yeah, you go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah as, a, as a German citizen, of, our, uh, citizen of course, I'm, I'm aware of the discussion uh, in uh, my country of origin. Uh, you know, uh, you possibly are aware that uh, the German parliament had been subject to quite a mass massive, uh, let's say, a hacker attack as early as late 2015. In the course of 2016, there had been uh, additional uh, activities uh, targeting, for example, one of the major parties of the country. So, and if uh, Hans-Georg Maaßen was here, he certainly would uh, present uh, to you that point that, of course, uh, German authorities, his, let's say, service, as well as, let's say, at large, let's say, German, uh, let's say, security and police authorities are very well aware of that, and that the political milieu uh, in Germany uh, is aware of uh, the risk of leaks, the quality of which, of course, uh, is not yet clear, but... Uh, all uh, representatives of political parties have already committed themselves, uh, following a little bit the example of France, uh, not, for example, to make use uh, of, uh, let's say, uh, results being proposed uh, by, by hacks, by leaks, let's say hacks, uh, let's say, and uh, then the leaks following on that. Uh, so we'll see how it uh, translates into action uh, during the election campaign, uh, which is now slowly but surely unfolding. Uh, but everybody, frankly speaking, is let's say, anticipating that uh, s at least similar uh, attempts uh, for uh, influencing uh, public uh, perception uh, are going to happen. There is no reason why they should not happen. Uh, we, uh, in that regard, uh, kind of resilience, I may say, yeah? attempts of building up resilience and uh, really building up... Uh, uh, antibodies, let's say, in the political discussions are underway, uh, but of course it's a first. Yeah? We'll see whether, let's say, the German political system and uh, society, uh, how they will uh, react. But that's, let's say, the scenario we are, we are uh, looking at. I just want to maybe fire up. What, there was <coughs> another couple of questions that might be interesting. One is um, the next phase, from where you sit, what's coming over the horizon that, that worries you? Um, Keir mentioned the idea yeah, yeah. of fake videos, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what's coming over the horizon? Well, in fact, um, f first, let's say, over the horizon, let's start, first of all, more from much more of what we have seen yet, because, I mean, uh, it's still relatively limited. We have seen some spectacular cases, so there's no reason uh, to believe that these cases, which had been to to a certain extent, been perceived as successful. They had made an impact. It had uh, been very difficult to quantify and qualify that impact. But anyway, uh, it uh, seemed at least uh, to have some impacts, at least uh, from the perception of the presumed perpetrators. So why not, uh, first of all, following that line of successful attempts? Uh, of course, I, I mean, I agree with Keir, one of the technical uh, feasible uh, ways 
uh, would be, for example, uh, creating uh, fake videos, fake reality, let's say it this way in a, in a larger sense, regardless of the technical means. Fake reality or the simulation of uh, reality uh, will be a logical development. And we should just uh, stick to the old wisdom, uh, which is not a nasty one, but anyway, yeah, that what is possible, what is technically possible, will be done. Uh, where we have no clue, uh, frankly speaking, when this horizon uh, uh, might, when this uh, development uh, really starts. But uh, uh, as well, cynically speaking, right. as the longer we talk about it, the more likely it will be. Right. I won't um, ask you this question. I shall just say it must be quite difficult at an EU level, given how many people in the EU still think that um, Assange and Snowden are heroes. But I won't ask you to answer that. Um, Ivana, um, do you want to pick up any of those ones? Um, what's coming over the horizon? How worried should be about election? Uh, there were many questions. I don't even know where to start. But I start with the, with the one I think you started with. Like, how do you measure the effect? Like, whether it's actually effective, the whole campaign? And this is really challenging. And we have a lot of discussions, roundtables, conferences, just like on how do you measure the, the impact of the disinformation. This is really challenging because without like proving something is a problem, you can't really push the politicians to do anything. So it's crucial. But unfortunately, this is such a complex and like hard to grasp issue that is, I mean, how would the world look without the Russian disinformation or like pro-Russian disinformation? Probably we would still have the losing people losing trust institution, in institutions, politicians, we would have all kinds of crises we have, but maybe there will be less of them. So it's really hard. I mean, there are, there are indications like changing voting patterns. I mean, you have opinion polls in many countries which are showing the, the trust in EU is, uh, is, is falling. So there are some indications, but there's nothing like a, well, this is the effect. It's not like somebody's blowing mm -hmm. a building or something. So that's why it's such a, such a hard topic mm -hmm. To study. But I'll just give you one example, uh, well actually two from Czech Republic and Slovakia, now Soviet Slovakia. So how, because I think actually those disinformations are very effective. But in the often the counter argument that I get is, uh, well, actually not that many people are, 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 are like the viewers of, of disinformation, for example, outlets versus like mainstream outlets, it's usually much lower. But the numbers themselves are also very deceptive. Because when you look at the specific topics, then those websites are better. Like there's a Slovak blogger uh, who analyzes. Uh, there are online services where you can analyze the engagement of articles on social media according mm -hmm. to a topic. Mm -hmm. Like what are the most engaged articles? And the first seven results on the topics like EU, immigrations, uh, Merkel, etc. The first seven results of the most shareable, most those that produce the most engagement on social media, none of them was from mainstream media. Uh, all of them were from disinformation websites. So overall, the mainstream media are winning because they are covering broad range of topics. But in specific topics, the media, those media are much, much better in like, you know, using catchy title, having emotionally charged uh, articles, right. using negative emotions. Thank and this you. is attracting the viewers. So I think actually they're very effective, yeah. but it's really hard to prove without the concrete data. Then uh, what is like, what are the other forms of influence maybe uh, that, that are still kind of unexplored? Because we talk about websites, about trolling, about Facebook, a lot, Twitter. But there are other platforms that are becoming more and more uh, used and still we don't know much about it. For example, YouTube. There's so many videos, it's so easy. It's easy, easier than with the article. And YouTube is full of like, videos of, of, of that get a lot of like attention uh, and, and mm -hmm. that are used for disinformation, for propaganda, for fakes, for hate, <laughs> etc. And then another interesting thing is a direct emailing, for example. That is becoming, uh, especially with the older generation that are not, not using social media like Facebook so much, they're getting a lot of emails from their friends, somebody from a Google group, etc., which are like basically they copy the text or like uh, spreading this mm -hmm. information. Very, no, very little is known about this phenomenon. That's really interesting. So there are still a lot of like challenges, a lot of platforms. Also, I use mostly Facebook and Twitter, but the younger people around 15 to 20, they don't use it so much. They use other platforms as well, yeah. which I, I, I don't have, even have an account on. Right. Still, still a lot of things to, to, uh, 
Okay. To analyze, uh, what else? Uh, let's 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 move on. Let's not move not on. everybody has to answer ev every question. Okay. We've got uh, about <laughs> 15 many. more hands all going up, <laughs> which I want to uh, need to get to. But um, Tom, would you want to respond to a very specific question from Raoul about the Estonian election system? The elections, and and um, I would also like to answer the, the question about the um, do we add uh, fuel to the fire if we talk about uh, the, uh, the these things. The um, the Estonian elections. Uh, so there were so many angles covered, but I think. Um, <clears throat> I think first that we have to be clear that there hasn't been any <coughs> cyber attacks <coughs> against the uh, voting system. There have been information campaigns, and we've been bad in, in, in explaining them. And um, I'm a high-ranking civil servant and uh, talking about political issues now, so um, hopefully it works out fine for me. But uh, <laughs> Estonia has had a change of government uh, lately. We used to be in a very um, uh, easy position that uh, those who are who were in power uh, were for e stuff, e voting among that. Uh, Jarno Limnell in, in, in one event I remember uh, said that one thing Estonia does clearly better than Finland is that you have President Ilves. You have a political spokesperson. Now we, ha we are in a situation that the party that used to be in opposition is now in government. The party who was in opposition was against the e-voting, now is in power. And members of that party are attacking the e-elections, and non nobody is, is defending it in a political level. So we're in a situation where the technical people have to debate with the politicians. It's not a good formula. The, um, um, uh, the cyber attack against the elections would require enormous resources. Uh, against the Estonian voting system. Um, it's much easier and more effective mm -hmm. to do a PR campaign than, than, than to conduct a, a cyber campaign. Why we are failing in, in communication, I think, is that uh, beside the political reason, it's, it's also that uh, there is no clarity in, in roles uh, in Estonia. Mm -hmm. uh, who's responsible for, for what? There are so many players. Uh, we are responsible for er electronic identity. Information, the, the voting services for the voting system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Who does what? Who does Stratcom? That, that's our problem. Okay. And the, so the second thing I wanted to, to talk about is, is how we, uh, we handle those, uh, the cyber issues. Is, is, uh, Estonia has decided to be as transparent as possible, to talk about what's, what's happening. We did it in 2007. We tried to do it now. Uh, we tried to, when we're talking about Estonian e election system, we tried to, we published everything, uh, the code is public, please come explore. Um, and we have hoped that this transparency uh, will help us to, to um, stand against the, uh, the uh, uh, info attacks as well. Right. It hasn't worked out that well. And uh, what uh, keeps me awake is I'm not that worried in, in, in Russian uh, attacks against the system. I think we would detect it, it would be very, uh, expensive uh, to, to conduct one. I'm much more worried that we cannot get the communication right. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Kia, do you want to pull, up, pull, pull together one, of, one or two of those? Um, uh, you, you already touched on the next phrase, but perhaps James's question would be a, a good one if you want to engage with that, or, or indeed any of the others. Certainly. Well, I'll try to keep it very brief. There's plenty of meat. I don't know Kostya had a good question, but Jarmo first, am I worried there will be interference in elections? No because there will be. There's no point worrying about it. Let's instead <laughs> do something about it. Uh, the range of people who will be interfering, I think, is going to grow because the amateurs will get on board as well as those who have state interests at heart, given the mounting dissatisfaction in various countries with the current political systems, including in my own country. It's what they do that will be interesting. And here we come into the next phase. Let's take a couple more examples of capabilities which adversaries have been stockpiling and testing and not yet deploying. Within that, I mean, for example, the capacity for targeted messaging on a mass scale, not carefully crafted spear phishing emails, but triaging groups of population by their activity or their location or their role, and then sending them messages simultaneously which appear to come from trusted sources. We've seen multiple examples of that uh, over the last three years, which appear to be trial runs, sometimes possibly even mistaken trial runs. 
Building on that as well, the, the troll and bot stockpiles that are not actually in use at the moment. We've seen large numbers of them diverted between various uh, targets in various countries, but there is a great deal more out there that are steadily building up followers ready for use for an unspecified purpose in the future. Going one step further, let's not forget that in the background to all of this, our adversaries are practicing achieving total information dominance by shutting down portions of the internet, by interfering with physical communications infrastructure and also interfering with media directly. I give you, for example, the intense interest in subsea cables, in communication satellites, the test run of shutting down TV5 Mont in Paris, plenty more besides. Kostya's question, uh, how long will Guardian-esque uh, attitudes persist and, and treat uh, Assange, Snowden, individuals who have done immense harm to our collective national security and benefit our adversaries immensely? How long will they be lionized? Well, for as long as the Guardian exists and for as long as it speaks to a constituency within, within our societies. I'm, I don't think it's going to way, go to away anytime soon, I'm afraid. Simple answer, not a happy one. Uh, finally, um, James, do our responses improve their capabilities? No, they simply choose them to select other ones which have not yet been deployed because they are several steps ahead. So there are things that we can already see coming over the horizon that have not been used yet, may well in the future, in a mixture that uh, it is impossible to predict. And there may be plenty of other things that we've not even guessed at. But does that mean we should not respond? No, of course not. The responding is the only alternative, and that ends badly, as we saw in the United States. Great. Okay, now I'm going to ask, I, I, I apologise, I'm not going to get everybody in, I'm, um, but I will try and get the, the hands I saw already. And I'm going to go first of all to Jamie, then to Carolina, um, then over there. But we have the microphone, stand up please. And please make your quest one question only, and preferably a brief one. Yeah, just I wanted to contrast the very admirable behaviour of the German political leadership. I'm sorry, Jamie Kirchick, Foreign Policy Mission. Uh, already coming out and saying that they're not going to exploit and take advantage of any Russian leaks. If you contrast that to the Republican Party in my country, where it was very visible and very clear what was going on, and you had the vast majority of Republicans and conservatives in the media basically taking part in a Russian influence operation against our country, um, with the exception of maybe Senator Marco Rubio, who said, hey guys, today it's the Democrats who are being exposed, tomorrow it could be us. And this was really reprehensible behavior, and I think it is incumbent upon leaders in democracies to put aside partisan politics and put the interests of the country first. Yeah. Thank you. Great. And then, Caroline, stand up, please. There's a microphone over there, please. Thank you. My name is Carolina van der Talen. I'm with the Swedish Defense Research Agency. I specialize in Russia, so... Uh, I take the point that we need to have a broader approach, but I'm going to use the Russia hook anyway. I think when we think about information and warfare, it's important to know your opponent. And we, we talk about Russia now as omnipotent, omnipresent. In fact, Russia feels very vulnerable in this arena, and especially now as it, it's uh, entering it into its election cycle. Uh, one of the things that Russia is obsessed with is how we influence their younger cohort of the population. And so I would guess that that's one of the things that they would be trying to do to us as well. And just to illustrate my point, how Russia, uh, how, how we can, by knowing Russia, we can understand what they're doing here. Uh, they have this wonderful uh, profession of uh, political technologists. One of the things that they've been doing inside Russia is to produce <coughs> fake opinion polls before elections. Uh, to sway the, the opinion. Uh, this was exactly what they did in the French election. Right. So by knowing Russia, I think we can, we can predict the next generation. Super. I'm going to give preference to people who haven't asked questions already. Can we have the microphone over there for um, Jill and then uh, uh, Jakob? Thank you very much, Jill Doherty from the Wilson Center. I just wanted to uh, briefly ask, Care already raised this, and I think it's an important issue, of um, how you fight back. Because the increasingly it's shown that facts don't always matter, that people get locked into their own, or you could almost call them belief systems, and so they will see facts, but they will reject them because of their preconceived notions. And I'm just raising with the panel, th this is something that I think is increasing, it's almost uh, a disconnect from the way we look at this traditionally. So 
what do you do with that fact that people sometimes will not believe facts? So you put, and then just behind you, Jakob. Hello, I'm Jakub Janda from the European Values Think Tank in Prague. Basically, I, I will use a political question, which I know Ivana and Kier are uh, basically possibly able to answer. Uh, basically, uh, first, uh, if when Germany is now steaming up in this, not only because of the elections, the Bundeswehr and uh, other, other events, basically Germany is uh, going to the front line, how do you think other countries can help them to become the, front, the, the leading guys on answering Russian subversion, given all the local uh, specifics? And this, let me put a second question in, it's a one one Basically, why is Federica Mogherini suppressing her own team on this? I have the answer, but I want you to answer it. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much. The, the, yeah, there's a fantastic um, EU disinformation team, which, although Keir's quite right, we all get too much in our inboxes. I really like this um, EU vs. Disinfo. It's on Twitter, and I strongly recommend it. Everyone here in the room should, um, should subscribe. Um, then we, the gentleman there in the front, I can't see you because of the light. Stand up, please, and we'll get a microphone to you, and then I'm back to the panel. <laughs> Thank you, Charles Salonius Pasternak, Finnish Institute oh, of International sorry. Affairs. Um, first, a comment to what's next. I think one thing that is already being developed is uh, combining AI and machine learning to create bots which are considerably harder to distinguish as being machines and not humans. And this generates then lots of consequences potentially. My question is, we focused on the digital, which is fair enough, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on the analog. Um, kind of person to person, politician to decision maker uh, influencing. I, I say this only because I don't think fake news or, or online behavior had anything to do with, for instance, the Finnish government's rather unexplicable decision to accept Rosatom as the main owner in our new power plant. It much more likely had to do with politician to politician, I'll call disinformation threats, et cetera. So combining the kind of analog and the digital space to actually get an effect. Thanks very much, Charlie. Well, this is, um, I'm, I'm really aware of how much expertise we've got in the audience and also that we could probably carry on all day or indeed have a, a week-long conference on this, but we actually only have 25 minutes left. So I'm going to ask the panel, um, don't feel you have to respond to all the questions, just pick the one that you thought was most interesting. And um, I'll go again from right to left. Gerhard, please go first. <laughs> Yeah, uh, let's let's uh, think about uh, what what can we do with people who don't believe in facts. I mean, this is of course one of the riddles. Uh, as a hybrid fusion center, let's say we are not, of course, the, the first address uh, to to comment on that question. But let's say one of the let's say policies we are trying to support by raising awareness uh, is enabling all our correspondence inside the EU and, of course, in member states, and I'm not dwelling too much on that because it's, of course, quite a large number of uh, let's say, counterparts we have uh, and which we, which we uh, support with our analysis, raising awareness of this kind of trends, uh, of, uh, let's say, fake realities, uh, uh, and uh, just uh, communicating with them on how then to address this problem. Raising awareness, I mean, raising as well awareness not only on the fake part of news, but let's say raising awareness on news and trying to corroborate news and putting forward that kind of, uh, uh, let's say, of, uh, let's say uh, solid information stock and not relent in doing so, although that's not our job, yeah? but let's say that's a job, of course, of media, yeah? and media, as you know better than me, media are already the so-called traditional one, the established media are already creating pools of, I say, uh, uh, experts in establishing facts. Mm. Uh, and frankly speaking, I think that's not, 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 uh, the, not the bad idea yeah? at all, yeah? to do that, just having, that's reasserting, let's say, <coughs> reality and trying because uh, now uh, what have been met, uh, mentioned very often is if you living if you are creating your own uh, bubble your own information bubble uh, let's say uh, among friends self assured how to break that how to open it up and say please yeah, don't yeah. stick to your own personal reality but let's say please take note of the 
reality as a majority, hopefully, of people perceive it. I mean, we are here uh, nearly in a philosophical question as well. Huh? Uh, what is reality? Uh, uh, but let's say we will have here, uh, this is part of resilience building. And this part of resilience building is, of course, mainly being done inside the countries, inside the societies. Here, for example, we, as I said, uh, uh, as an assessment center, we can only assess state, let's say, some problems. Uh, and then leave it or, let's say, ask people to address them uh, because that's, let's say, uh, the job we have been doing. I mean, be, that's the main element I would uh, like to address. Yeah. It's really difficult, this, because I'm not sure there's a clear dividing line. In fact, I know there isn't a clear dividing line between fake news and bad journalism. <laughs> and I also think yeah. that the, the sort of people who mm. consume this um, disinformation are not necessarily in, 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 um, influenced by facts. And we, living in a sort of high-end media consumers, living in a very fact and argument-based world, we respond quite well to myth-busting and, and things like that and say, yes, that's clear. You know, they said it was a million, it's actually a billion. They said it was Iran, it's actually Iran. They said it was a, you know, this happened to this plane, but it actually was the other way around. So we respond to that, but we are not necessarily the target. So yeah. I feel this, um, this, this sort of fact-based rebuttal is a necessary, but yeah. it's absolutely not a sufficient condition um, for dealing with this. So, Ivana, I'd be interested in your, uh, um, your take on that. I also like, would like to respond to this question like, about how to fight back, fight back when like, some people don't believe in facts. I mean, when you're trying to come up with some counter strategy, you need to think about the, like, the target groups. You're, like, uh, there's no one project that will like, solve the whole situation, but if you start with the first one, which is we who are sitting here, experts who are like, uh, aware of the topic, for us it's really important, like debunking, all this kind of like analyzing, understanding it, based on it we can propose some, some uh, responses. Then there is like the biggest part of the, we're somewhere in the middle, you know, still educated, but don't really know about, much about it. With them, I think it's very important to raise awareness about it, because then you're building their critical thinking. And then there's this part of the society, which is like, even if you give them facts, even if you tell them like how it works, they will just not, they just don't believe it because it's not within their like beliefs, you know? And this is, this is I think the most challenging for us. Actually, we had this discussion, Ben Nemo has been doing quite a good research on this, like what to do with people who are already radicalized, already like conspiracy believers and are very hard to approach. Uh, actually for this, you need a psychotherapy. No, no, really, it needs to be one-on-one -on -one approach and talking to the people why he's got these beliefs, what is behind it, going to the roots. And I mean, this is very, again, this is very challenging, but you can have a grassroots initiatives, local NGOs, people like trying to like talk to those people. And one of the, related to, the, to this, one of the, like for me, most troubling consequences of the current situation is the polarization of the society how those groups cannot really, like increasingly cannot really talk to each other and find the common ground, you know? And you can see it in many, many countries. And I live in Ukraine, I have talked to many people. You know, a few years ago, we had, you know, we were kind of like, we in Russia, we could be one day friends, you know? We have common history, we have common values, or like, sort of. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's take this back. We have a common history, a language. Uh, maybe one day we can integrate. This position has disappeared now. You're either strongly anti-Russian or pro-Russian. And this is happening in the US, you're either strongly anti-Trump or pro-Trump, pro Brexit, etc. So the polarization of the society, I think it's one of the challenges we need to address yeah. very soon. And then Germany, just briefly, uh, we haven't really mentioned the Facebook and Google themselves, like what they are doing. And Germany is now proposing a law uh, that they will find uh, technological companies, if they don't fight the hate speech, I think, uh, on, the, on their platforms. And this is a great incentive how you can actually push those technological company to do something about it. And I, and I talked to them recently with both of them, and things are changing on their front as well. Yeah. Like a year ago, they wouldn't even like, touch this topic. It was too political. Now they have teams of people working on just on this topic and trying to, you know, and I don't want to, we are not on Chatham House, are we? No, I'm afraid this is being live streamed. <laughs> so. Okay, so I'll stop here. <laughs> <laughs> but see Ivana later for private comment. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm, I'm really worried about this. So on the one hand, I applaud attempts to bring the tech giants to account. And to some extent, they're just making money out of the destruction of our political system. On the other hand, I was just talking to someone from a 
um, very senior, uh, from a large micro-blogging um, tech company which are dealing social media, which I won't name, who said they'd been approached by the Russians, um, saying that you now accept that hate speech is, um, must be kicked off your service. Navalny is breaking our laws. Please kick him off. I was going to say Twitter, but that would be, um, you know, kick him off your service. And, you know, how do we respond to that? That's going to be really difficult if we go down this road of um, applying the criminal justice system full blast to social media. Um, tell me, I know it's difficult for you as a, as a government official, but um, within the parameters of the job that you have, at least for now, um, do you want to come back on any of those questions? Yeah, <clears throat> how, how we fight back, I think that's, that's a, the core of the, in the core of the issue is, and I completely agree with uh, Ivana here. It's, uh, uh, I think we should, uh, the role of the government here is, is to become public of what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, we can provide the information. Cyber, you need to talk about what's happening. It's not, in cyber defense, you cannot do like you do conventional defense. You have to be as public, as transparent as possible. You have to talk about what's happening. The Russians, I think, they believe that they're doing well. It's what they, it's, it's cheap, it's effective. They keep on doing it. So what we can do is, is, is to talk about it. And uh, luckily, in the past year, we've seen that more and more countries are doing it. Uh, and what we as persons can do is, is, um, is to explain to those people who, who don't believe in facts, I think we all have a role. Now that everybody, ha everybody has a voice, we need to start using our voice as well. When we go to our class reunions, we need to explain to our old classmates of what's happening. Uh, it's, it's very tiresome, I know, but, uh, but we need to do that. We, the reason needs to get out there as well. Um, and the second, I think what we can do and we should put more effort into is, is to really get the bad guys. Is, uh, is that those cyber attacks when John Bodesta's Gmail account is, is hijacked, that those who were responsible, who stole that information, will get punished. So we can uh, later, that it, later say that it's not some sort of an abstract uh, cyber attack, but there are concrete persons behind that, and they got their justice. Right. Um, uh, Kia, coming to you next, but can we have the microphone in the front row to Lisa, who will ask the next question. Um, Kia, do you want to look at that analog versus digital um, link that Charlie mentioned, or indeed one of the others? Actually, a couple of brief points on a couple of the others, because Charlie, yes, I agree. Carol <laughs> <laughs> highlighted very correctly that Russia's intense uh, sense of vulnerability to weaponization of information I think it's important to think about this because the measures that they have taken to protect themselves, if we're thinking in terms of societal resilience, illustrate precisely the scale of the problem. They've put in place a number of measures to constrain and control and isolate information which are completely compatible with Russian historical attitudes, but totally unacceptable in Western liberal democracies. They have a range of tools to protect themselves against the partly imaginary threat from the West that is simply not available to us. Let's not forget this as a country, I'm not talking about the Cold War, which plenty of people in this room remember, but back through Russian history, this is a country which has repeatedly banned completely the import of possession of foreign books because information from abroad is so evil and pernicious. We're not really in a position to do that. Uh, Jill asked how we puncture the filter bubble and how we reach people who are already convinced of the alternative facts. There is another understudied area which is the amount of effort and investigation and research that has gone on already into how to reaching people in that situation in the context of counter-radicalization and counter-violent extremism. Now, I'm not saying that uh, those efforts, counter-radicalization, are effective. Some people say they are not. However, it is the case that very detailed and very expensive research has already been done on the methods that are required in order to do exactly what you're describing. Unfortunately, Ivana's right. It is labor-intensive. It is hard. Mm -hmm. But we do already know to some extent what works and what does not. Super. Um, Lisa Parson. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ed. And I'm Lisa Past. I do cyber and stratcom in Estonia. Uh, and my question really is, you know, what can nations do and how much can we act as a community of like-minded nations, the rhetoric that's kept the EU and NATO together to the current level? As this panel highlighted and as Keir reiterated, these incidents will continue to happen. And the new bad news is that it's not just cyber and information operations against Western nations. It's also economic warfare, it's also lawfare. We know that this major inconvenience below the 
threshold of an armed attack or use of force. So below the threshold of warfare will continue. And what has, and you know, what James called the Hydra, the adversary strategy is clearly reactively opportunistic, opportunistically reactive. And uh, what was discussed so far under the wide sort of umbrella of deterrence were very particular, also opportunistically reactive measures. Information operations, you know, identifying and mitigating particular events. The French success story is using doubt to breed doubt, using confusion to fight confusion. But yet we still talk about deterrence as a wider thing. Clearly not working for us. So as I see it, there's two options. Either the Western community also becomes incredi incredibly opportunistically reactive, or we're still on our high horse of deterrence. And both of these have costs. Losing the consensus-based long-term view of deterrence costs us as a community, but not being reactive and opportunistic and quick means we'll lose operationally. So where do we go? Excellent. Could you just pass the microphone to the gentleman behind you? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Stefan Meister from the German Council on Foreign Relations. I don't want to play down the whole thing, and I'm really one of the first persons uh, in, in Germany, in the German academic sphere, think tanks here, which were really dealing with disinformation systematically. But I think what I observe at the moment uh, as a big threat is panicking. Panicking about a disinformation. Um, if, I, if I look to the, to the German public, I think my, my, in the public discussion, my impression is... Uh, what we think what Russia is doing uh, seems to have more impact what Russia really is doing. So I think this threat of, of what Russia all can do uh, is, is in some parts much higher, in my opinion, what, what impact they really have. Because it deletes also from the, from the problems we have. It's much more than the discussion of, about how Russia interferes in, in our own societies than the vulnerabilities, the weaknesses, the deficits we have in our societies. Right. What do you think about this? Okay, do you pass the microphone along to Georgi Kandalaki, who's, uh, or is it Giga? Giga. <laughs> to, to Georgia. Go ahead, Giga. Oh, okay. Thank you. It's Giga Bukeria from Georgia, European Georgia parliamentary opposition. Uh, one simple question. I mean, coming from Carter, where in the last five, six years, the pro-Russian online outlets have mushroomed and they really got the initiative. Now we see some kind of healthy reaction. There are a lot of projects, uh, myth busters responding to fake news. But my concern is that I would like to hear the speaker's opinion is that there is no offensive game on our side, at least in Georgia. There is, there is no demonizing, no ostracizing of the outlets or websites or individuals, no labeling them as they are, the Russian fifth column. Uh, and again, I understand that some might think that we might be risking some McCarthyism, but I think there's a high time to have a real aggressive game because that's the only way, because you cannot uh, be all the time saying that no, West is not a threat, they won't force our kids to become gay and so on and so forth without making the sources of this uh, uh, disinformation illegitimate in societies. We are ostracizing them. Do you think that this is missing everywhere or do you think it's a problem? Because I'm personally against any kind of criminal prosecution because I think it will backfire, it will be very yeah. dangerous. But labeling them, it's our legitimate right to call them their name. Thank you. That's great. And a question over there, I can't see who you are, but you um, introduce yourself. Yeah, so. another Georgian in the room. And just to add to what Giga said, uh, I mean, we all know that there are some sources which spread propaganda narratives on the regular basis and they kind of spread these lies for a living. And uh, I have a question to, I mean, when does spreading lies become a criminal offense? And if there can be any legalistic or legislative solutions to that? Okay, well those two questions fit together quite well and I think will be the basis for our final um, two minutes for everybody on the, on the panel. It's about how we fight back. And I think you know, in, in every country there is some sort of criminalization um, or sanction on speech. Even in the United States, if you show a nipple, even the tiniest bit of nudity on an FCC regulated television station, or if you swear on an FCC regulated radio station, you are in very serious trouble. So there, there is always some role for, um, for, 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 for government here. I'm deeply skeptical about whether we should do it, but I'd be interested to hear what the panel say, because I think that anything we do um, 
can be cop it can also be applied by the Russians. But the broader question of um, and, and then there's ostracism, which is absolutely right. And I think there's a lot to be um, done on that. And I think I've just seen in the, um, the United the United States Congress has said that Sputnik and RT can't mm. come as um, can't have regular press press credentials. So there's um, in the, and this question of how we treat people who say I'm a journalist from Sputnik. Maybe we should say no, you're not. Um, I mean, you are from Sputnik, but you're not a journalist. Um, but I, but I, I'd like each of the panel, I think I'll go the other way around now, starting with um, Keir, to give us a kind of a mini manifesto. If you were, you know, we are talking to decision makers here, we have Estonian politicians, other politicians in the room. What's our message from this conference to decision makers of, as Churchill would say, action this day? What do we need to actually practically start doing right now to deal with this hybrid intelligence, information, cyber threat? Go ahead, Keir, start. Sorry. Okay. Those last four questions have put together a list of action points. Okay, cooperate. We've talked about the number of different sources that are working on disinformation. Why are they not able to avoid this duplication of effort? Why is there not some overarching organization, body, even individual, that can actually combine all of this effort and focus it instead of uh, the, the distributed effort among nations, organizations, again, individuals? We can do better on that, and that will help also with the other aspect of being proactive of actually identifying the trends more quickly and uh, acting to, to, to deal with them. Should we panic over disinformation? Well, no, but uh, how seriously should we take it? I go back to my earlier point about metrics until we measure the problem, or rather measure the effect of the problem. We don't know whether any extent of panic is actually justified or whether we can safely ignore it. It's an unknown at the moment. And uh, finally, the, the ostracism thing, well, we also have to get the advertisers that fund RT and Sputnik to ostracize them, but progress has been made in that the balance imperative is less of a problem for media in those countries where awareness has been raised that they are under external threat and external attack. It is no longer the case that you have to automatically report both sides of the story, even when there is only one. Therefore, you do not necessarily have to report disinformation, fake news, alternative facts, because you're supposed to show balance, you can actually uh, accept that this is somebody trying to deceive you as a media outlet and therefore disregard it. I hope someone will tell the BBC that. Not um, yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, just on, on, yeah, super, okay, go ahead, um, Tamar, your, your, your thoughts on that. Just one thought to add that, um, and I don't know how to do it, uh, I know that we need to do it, but how to do it, I don't know, is, is we have to be clear what we're talking about. It's uh, after the U.S. elections attack, the uh, the Dutch decided not to use any information systems in their elections. That they're going to count all the votes by hand. We're not going to trust the technology at all. Uh, the French abolished their um, uh, internet-based voting for uh, people abroad. Uh, I don't know if those uh, decisions were made because of panic or uh, because. Uh, they had some real uh, threat assessments behind that. But uh, it seems to me that the discussion is, is a lot of time fueled by panic when we're talking about trusting the technology. Um, and I don't know how to achieve that, that we actually have some, uh, some um, useful discussion that uh, both sides are, are, are aware of what they're talking about. And we are, we are having, a, I would like to see that, that we're having a, a debate on the substance, not just shouting out declarations. But we should get to that, that we can have a substa substantial discussion. And it's, I think it's the role of the journalists there to, to help us along uh, with that. Very good. Ivana? Uh, OK. I'll start with the labeling, uh, because I find this an important issue. Uh, if they cross the line, if they breach a law, I think they should be prosecuted. If it's on the basis of hate speech, if, if they anyhow breach the law, yes, prosecute them. And that's actually happening in Slovakia in some cases, uh, and uh, some other countries as well. But I would be very cautious with the labeling somebody being like Russian agent or Russian troll. And I'll give you an example. In Czech Republic and Slovakia, there's 100 websites, around 100 websites, that are spread, spreading pro-Kremlin disinformation. Out of those 100, one is owned by Kremlin, that is Sputnik. One is owned by Russian citizen that is living in Czech Republic, but no connection to Kremlin. This is it. That's all. All the others are like calling themselves alternative media. Yeah, if you call them useful, that's also another term that I would use, actually. I mean, 
the, the, the Sputnik is, for example, a big inspiration for them. So they're like taking the information. But if you start calling them Russian agents, you basically, again, and this is going, this is going to the polarization of the society, then you're making those people, all the people who are following them, Russian agents, Russian trolls. And I, I talk to many people who are like reading those websites. And they, they are not Russian agents, but people on social media are accusing them. Like, but where are you gonna get with this, like this, like with this discussion? If you're like, without having any proof, you're labeling somebody, which he might not be. I don't think this is the right approach. But uh, about the cooperation, that's true. We need, we don't have an overarching body that would like one platform where where you would go to get your information. What's happening? What's the new research? Who the bank what, etc. Uh, the good news is there's something currently being uh, developed uh, and it will be like a platform for us researchers, activists, NGOs, uh, institutions that are focusing on it. It's gonna be uh, announced in like in a couple of weeks. So, and there are some platforms being currently developed. So there is something also, I, I don't, let's see how, how effective it is, but there are some efforts for like one, one platform to rule it all. Um, that's it from me. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much. Well, F final word. Uh, taking up the, the question of cooperation, uh, which had been raised here in the, uh, in the audience as well, uh, I may just flag that, of course, uh, EU-NATO cooperation uh, provides as well for a pretty strong link, uh, also uh, in the level of the hybrid, uh, let's say, awareness, hybrid threat awareness. So the hybrid fusion center, for example, of the, of the EU is going to uh, join hands with the emerging hybrid analytical facility, I call it, right, which is now just uh, being built up by the end of uh, this month uh, in NATO. Yeah? Uh, so uh, joining hands over there building up uh, wherever it's kind of synergies and building up, uh, let's say, a, another kind of not joint platform, but let's say a combined platform mm -hmm. uh, of situational awareness, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, which then is reinforcing each other and of course reinforcing as well the awareness of the member states, governments and institutions is part of it. Mm -hmm. Of course, it cannot, it's not the direct <laughs> outreach then yeah, to the public, but it is the uh, outreach, a strong outreach, a strong voice uh, to vis-a-vis -vis member states, governments, member states, mm -hmm. uh, institutions, which then are hopefully taking it up and uh, working uh, on it uh, operationally. Thanks very much indeed. I, um, we have 30 seconds left, and I will <laughs> fill them by making two more points. One is that I think the basic principle at the moment should be don't make things worse. Um, we have allowed our dependence on computers and networks to grow far faster than our ability to defend those computers and networks, and we should draw a lesson from that. And I saw it a very nice one on Twitter the other day, if you can't protect it, don't connect it. Um, I think that would, be a, that would be a really good mantra going forward. Um, there's, uh, and, 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 and that, the other is I think we have to deal with the curse of anonymity. I think anonymity is great in some circumstances. If I was dealing with human rights in Russia or somewhere like that, I would want anonymity. But I think we have to privilege people who are real. And so I think social media and Twitter and Facebook are both working at ways of providing authentication so you'll know, is this actually a real person with a real bank account, real, mo real mobile phone, real address, and so on. And those people sh we should take more seriously. Um, and secondly, I think anonymous websites. And this is really binary, and I would just urge you as my final thing. When you see a website, always look and see the contact details. Um, is there a street address? Is there a phone number? Are there named people? If there are named people, do they actually stack up? Do they exist in the real world? If you're a bit more technical, look at the who is. See if they, and and it's, it's surprising how many of these Russian sites fizzle off into anonymity. And I think we could do a much better job in highlighting those when people, um, when people click on them. Um, for more details, please read my book. Um, <laughs> please join me in thanking our four excellent panelists, particularly Ivana for stepping in at short notice. <laughs> <laughs>